resistors against the disgenesis of modernity. It's Govan here with GovanKilgore.com and SecretsOfLongevity.com. I might work on that intro a bit as I'm looking to combine all, well, just the two channels I used to have on YouTube into sort of one overarching topic. I'm going to still be doing health videos here and there. Uh, I was recently doing some martial arts videos, got more coming out on that. Just have a lot of footage, I just got bored with editing it to be honest and had other stuff going on. It's been a crazy time here in lockdown. And I'm going to be putting these out on a new platform. I'll still post to YouTube as long as I can. It does, part of a big factor in why I stopped making videos was just the, how disgusted I was with the YouTube platform, censorship, etc. But there's some really interesting things coming out technologically in terms of uh, platforms. To get into the actual topic of this video, um, cryptocurrency is definitely a major factor in this current astrological period we're in, in relation to Uranus or Uranus, the uh, planet of technology and innovation, and with it being in Taurus, and because it's such a slow moving planet, it's in each of the 12 zodiac signs for a good length of time. And by the way, you can check out in the drop down menu in the info section below, uh, I'm gonna put some timestamps if you wanna skip around. And just to clarify, this video isn't about cryptocurrency specifically I'm just using it as a jumping off point at the start here to describe the effect Uranus has in a specific sign that it's in in relation to technology one of the things that Uranus rules now the other thing I want to mention is that this isn't a video about the effect of Uranus in one's natal chart we can obviously understand some of the things from here and extrapolate that to uh, horoscopic astrology um, but there's plenty of videos out there and articles on uh, Uranus's effect there. So I'll leave that up to people to discover on their own, through their own research. I'm vastly more interested in the effect Uranus has on the large-scale cycles that affect all of society and civilizations, etc. What I really want you guys to check out is the Hive network or ecosystem of social media. Long story short, it's built on the blockchain. Um, you upload it to the blockchain and there's different social media apps or decentralized apps, dApps, which has a wide array of different um, styles of communities. Some are kind of more like Twitter, some are like YouTube, some are like Facebook, some are like micro blogging or even longer form blogging. Uh, basically, people create these apps very easily and they're all on one blockchain, the Hive token blockchain or Hive coin, if you're familiar with Ethereum. Um, it's actually, it's a fork of Steemit. If you remember Steam uh, was the currency and Steemit was the platform that first came out. It was kind of the first social media thing associated with uh, cryptocurrency and altcoin. And you basically get and produce a currency by putting out content but also in upvoting and contributing to other people's work in terms of sharing it and things and the same thing applies uh, unfortunately steam it got overtaken by someone that's not so uh, likable by a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space and uh, yeah there's good things coming out with hive it's not even a year old yet I believe it was first created in March of 2020 and yeah I think people got to check it out because you actually create and earn income just through participating in it. Some of that is created through ads. I'll do a video on that topic itself and why I think it's so fantastic. But long story short, I'm going to be bringing everything I create into one place under one account. So I'm at Govan Kilgore over there. I don't know if I'm going to upload all my old videos there or not. I might. And the specific app that I'm going to start using, but there's other video platforms there too, is uh, Three Speak. And you can also just check out what else is on there just to see if you like the idea of it and who's posting there. But I think we can get a lot of uh, interesting content over there too. If some other people migrate over there, it's a lot better, I think, and more uh, freedom of speech oriented and uncensorable than some of the other alternatives people have been flocking to in the wake of these recent crackdowns on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. I'm going to start very... Uh, simple talking about just some basic facts about the planet the physical planet itself but then we're gonna get into the astrology we're gonna talk about the trends we see in the different topics Uranus governs um, when it's in each sign or more so the sign right now 
and then how that changes in the near future. I'm not going to talk about each and every sign because this is an 84 year cycle, but I'll talk about some of the upcoming signs in the not too distant future and also reference back to some more recent previous signs to give some idea of how these trends look. So as I was just saying there, the planet itself has an 84 of our years cycle around the sun. So one rotation of the sun or one rotation through all the zodiac signs is 84.02 years. So it's a very precise time frame. You can just say 84 years and it's bang on. Um, it's also got a 97.7 degree axial tilt, meaning while well, most planets rotate on an axis this way, it's rotated. So it has this weird uh, rotation and that also gives it the perception of having a ring around it that is, um, you know, this way as opposed to Saturn, which is like uh, a ring that's more on a plane, even plane <laughs> facing us if we're looking up at it in the sky. Some theories around this is that it came from outside of our solar system um, and just because of that it had this wonky tilt. To what degree you want to believe in some of these ideas of how it functions in space, <laughs> that's a whole other topic, but I'm just giving sort of the bare bones ideas around it. But that kind of gives an idea of its sort of alien nature. It's a very odd planet. Um, it's not super strong in my chart, personally, my natal chart, um, but I really relate to it. I think it's a very fascinating uh, planet within um, the zodiac and in astrology. Not so much on a natal side of things, although when some, it's prominent and strong in someone's chart, it's evident, but more so in the uh, effect it has on the planet, on humanity and cycles, larger scale cycles that we can examine and understand through it. But back to the simple things, um, it's also supposedly made of methane and it rains diamonds on Uranus. Now this is all super speculative. I have no idea how they reached that conclusion. Um, but that leads to some unfortunate associations. A lot of people say um, Uranus and they laugh at that. I don't know where that came about. I don't think there's any hard and fast definition, although you hear a lot of professional scientists and astronomers as well as astrologers saying Uranus or Uranus, because um, it's named after the Greek god Uranus, um, the god of the sky. Uh, so I don't know if Uranus or Uranus was like a alteration of it. So even though there's no hard and fast pronunciation, I tend to just avoid the one that has that sort of association with it. And now in this next section on the astrological and mythological traits, this is key because with most things in astrology, we get the associations and the effects it has in people's charts or in the uh, mundane chart of the moment or the planet. Um, we get these associations from their names and what those things represent in mythology. So like I said, there's Uranus or Uranus. The Roman equivalent was Calus, the god of the sky. They're both sky gods. And um, he gave birth to, uh, Uranus gave birth to Saturn or Kronos in the Greek uh, terms for their deities. And then uh, Zeus came from uh, Kronos. And in Roman it's Calus, uh, Saturn, and then Jupiter. So when talking about um, deities and the equivalents, I think it's just an interesting note to say Uranus, Calus, Anu, Osiris, and Shiva are, in my opinion, all related and all have the same origin. Shiva might be the one that's not fully there. It's like partially, um, it might be a mixture of Neptune, the equivalent of Neptune and Uranus. Uh, and you can see that with the trident and some other qualities there or Poseidon, I guess. But if we look at the mythologies of all of these figures, these deities, um, the major things is they're sky gods. Shiva's an exception though. Osiris also has that pigmentation and he's got like that teal look to his skin, the coloring. And of course, we've got the coloring of the planet, Uranus being kind of a teal bluish hue, which is quite fascinating. That happened to be associated there. But the major thing through all of these is that these were the original primal deities that got castrated. Again, Shiva's an exception in that it happened, he did it to himself. <laughs> and then Kali, there's a whole myth with Kali uh, squatting over him uh, to resurrect him, I believe. Again, don't, don't come at me. I'm just like going off the top of my head from my memory of these things. I'm not too keyed into the Vedic tradition and their mythologies. But Osiris, you have that um, set, I believe, castrated Osiris or chopped his whole body up. 
And when Isis brought them all back together, the one piece they couldn't find was his phallus. Um, Anu is the Mesopotamian sky god. His child um, was the one who castrated him. Kalos and Uranus, again, these were sky deities captured by Kronos or Saturn. And in all these myths, again, with Uranus, Kalos, and Anu, it's their grandchild who came and defeated their son. With Osiris, it was actually his brother who castrated him. Um, and then his son Horus came and uh, sort of overtook uh, rulership of heaven. Uh, and with Shiva, he castrated himself. So again, slight variances. And with Shiva, again, it's more removed, so it might have like a connection further back in the progress of these myth myths. Now, you could study and read about these deities in each myth to kind of get some ideas around the planet. Um, the other aspect with astrology is a lot of the events that happen with planets when they're in significant positions or in the case of Uranus um, when it was discovered. So it was actually discovered right in between the uh, French Revolution and the American Revolution, 1781. So it was actually confirmed as a planet in 1781 but it was actually first seen in 1690, so that was a little ways earlier, but it was that conf confirmation as a planet in 1781. So this really gives one of the most significant associations with the planet, which is rebellion, freedom, and individuality, and just not going with authority, being against whatever the authority of the day is saying. Um, so in that sense, it's not, it's a neutral planet. It's not very benefic, but it's not malefic. It can obviously switch between the two, depending on if you're on the receiving end of that rebellion or if you're participating in it and it's a successful rebellion, then you obviously have the perception of it being very beneficial. Uh, so it's a double-edged planet. It can be great for us, it can be a problem. Over time, it's been recognized as being very correlated to technology, electricity, and that's gonna be a whole section I talk about, which you can find in the drop-down menu to get skip to that section if you want, but there's trends in technology that happen and they tend to be very correlated I've found to Uranus being in specific signs and so the topics of that sign tend to be where uh, technology with that association advance the quickest or um, they break through into the public consciousness. doesn't mean that it's only happening in that area. We can have obviously technology in every area always advancing but it seems to always get hyper focused into one thing. Um, wherever Uranus is at. So with electricity, it's quite interesting that due to Uranus being the ruler of Aquarius, a lot of people are aware of that. It's a very basic understanding of the rulership scheme of the 12 signs. There's obviously the traditional rulers before the uh, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus were discovered um, due to them being needed to be seen through a telescope. Uh, the planets that you can view with the naked eye, the traditional planets. Um, they made up the rulership scheme and a bunch of them, actually all of them except for the sun and moon, ruled two signs. So you have like Mercury ruling Virgo and Gemini. You have Mars ruling Scorpio and um, Aries. But when you had these three extra planets, they just kind of stuck them in. It kind of throws the whole thing off kilter. But it helps to think of um, the three signs that have two rulers, a traditional and modern ruler, to have the influence of both. I find personally. So Aquarius has that traditional Saturn ruler, but it has this Uranian ruler which is very unique to say the least. And a lot of people, if you start to get into astrology, you start to know people with strong Aquarian traits, whether it's their rising sign, their sun sign, or they have a stellium there. They're very individualistic people, but also humanitarian generally, and they can be very um, odd or quirky. There's a saying, they march to the beat of their own drummer. That's the Aquarian vibe. And the glyph for Aquarius, which I'll throw up on the screen here, a lot of people consider it to be waves. And they think of the constellation of Aquarius where uh, it's often shown as a guy emptying a jug of water. And so they think of those jagged lines as being like water coming out of the jug. And it could be the association there or the origin of the glyph. I don't know if that's known for sure the exact uh, meaning behind it, I think with glyphs and symbols, when they're very simple, they can obviously have multiple meanings, and that's part of the wisdom from this, I think. And the fact that it's an air sign, a lot of people 
make that mistake because Aquarius sounds like aqua. It's got this guy pouring a jug of water out. They think it's a water sign. A lot of people make that mistake. It's actually an air sign. And what moves through the air in jagged lines? Well, lightning, electricity, and arcs, if you think of Nikola Tesla. Actually, that would be an interesting thing I've never done. I'm going to try and pull up and find Nikola Tesla's natal chart if it's out there. That's something I've never looked at. But that's like a strong association there is innovation, technology, electricity, that light bulb going off in the brain kind of eureka moment is Uranian. It's um, often said to be the highest octave energetically where we get like this flash of insight. And so that's another major thing it um, uh, governs is sort of this out of the blue events. So things that just totally shift things in a major way, whether it's in your own individual life or on the stage of all of humanity, Uranus can come in and just kind of bring about a change in events that no one was planning for, no one was trying to create. And that's also ties in with that rebellion and it's like that coming out of nowhere type vibe. Um, the other side to it, which I was just getting into, was the effect of social causes, humanitarianism. Um, that can be related to rebellion as well because people who rebel they're going against an authority they feel is oppressive. So they want themselves, whether it's an individual, so there's that individuality and in freedom, but it's also the movement of a whole group of people um, as a collective wanting to resist an oppressive regime. Um, but it can happen, you know, not just at the political level, but the social level, whether it's a friend group or it's the workplace, etc. cetera. And um, yeah, that is, both a good thing and a bad thing, because people can obviously have the wrong motivations for wanting to be rebellious. Um, now, again, within this whole idea of what Uranus represents in astrology and getting that information from mythology, we see a lot of people um, just blanket making the statement, which I think is just an overlay of their political biases, that Uranus, as well as Aquarius, the whole zodiac sign, is a progressive planet. And because it's humanitarian, it's all about this one specific political idea that happens to be popular right now. But if we look to the past, progressivism is a modern thing. Uranus has been around for 240 going on, 250 years now. And there's pl plenty of traditionalism and other effects Uranus would have influenced throughout that time. Uh, so again, this idea of it being the LGBT planet seems a little odd. You could say that the rebellious qualities it inspires and governs doesn't take a form. So whatever's the ruling ideology of the day or tradition within a society or civilization, whatever's the counter to that is going to be influenced and bolstered by Uranus. So in that sense, the LGBT movement could have been seen as uh, a grassroots sort of Uranian growing rebellion against traditional sexuality and family unit, etc. But I think we're at a point where we're seeing that becoming the norm now and other things shifting. And I think uh, a lot of people misidentify the effect of what happens with Uranus because, you know, 1776 wasn't about the rights for gays or what have you. You could also look at it in the sense of, um, a lot of planets have their positive and negative sides to them, even the benefics that bring positive things and good fortune into our lives. They have a negative side too. You know, Jupiter, people with a lot of Jupiter in the chart and Sagittarius and whatnot can have a tendency to become very fat because there's that expanding quality. So in the myths of Uranus and these other deities that I mentioned, they all get castrated. So what's really prominent right now in society that is supposedly marginalized but is pushed by corporations and it's kind of like a top-down push. It's not a bottom-up push. These people may have existed for decades. They were the fringe of the fringe of the LGBT world, but they're getting more prominent now. Um, and why is that? Is that a positive thing for society to have people castrating themselves? It's actually the downfall of Uranus when that uh, deity got castrated. And it was the moving in of his son, Kronos. And if we know Kronos is Saturn, what does Saturn rule? Corporations, big business. So the fall of Uranus is replaced with Saturn. Now the counter to Saturn is Jupiter. It brings in that positivity, the optimism and abundance, whereas Saturn's very restricting. So Uranus is all about freedom and whatnot, but in its degradation and its fall and its 
ending period. It is castrated. It is the trans identity. You might find that if it might argue the wrong way to hear that, but that's just the reality of what we get from the myths. So in this section, I'm talking more about Aquarius, ruled by Uranus as well as Saturn. Um, some of the traits of Aquarius and also the house rulership scheme, uh, how Uranus interacts with that. So if you're familiar with the 12 houses, um, and I tried to explain this to someone who had probably more astrological experience than me and they were very standoffish with my definition of this, but they couldn't really like counter it. They were, they were just saying that's not how it's done. But again, I think this is pretty standard is that you take the signs in their normal uh, scheme, so Aries, uh, Taurus, etc., all the way through ending with Aquarius and Pisces. And those are the 12 signs, uh, but they're also the imprint for the 12 houses. There's other qualities and other things that create the associations we have with the houses, but uh, a big thing is just the signs themselves. So even though your rising sign or your first house might be um, something that's not Aries, you can almost imagine like a layer with the signs of the zodiac and then another layer of the same wheel if you're talking about whole sign houses where they're all the same uh, size of houses and whatever your rising sign is you just rotate that to that sign so for myself i'm a capricorn rising the qualities of aries have to do with the face your appearance um the first house uh, and then you overlay capricorn onto that the physical body um now the 11th house is uh, the one that would be ruled by Aquarius or created and based on Aquarius. And that's the house we see uh, associated with um, groups, friends, um, networks, humanitarian causes, technology, um, anything to do with organizations. Um, not quite the same as the 10th house, which is more government and corporations and businesses. The 11th is more the NGOs, the uh, things we might think of as being generally to be positive, but I think in our current age they tend to be a bit more on the subversive side, and I think that's just due to the f ending of the period we were in, in Pisces. Moving into the age of Aquarius, I, we're talking about something different here, which is the macro time scale of the precession of the equinox, where there's about 2,150 years per sign, and we went through Pisces and are now into the age of Aquarius depending on your view of when that began. I think it began in 2012. Um, but the 11th house there, uh, humanitarianism, charities, etc. These are all topics of the 11th house and they fit in and make sense to be associated with Aquarius. We also have teams and clubs and again, there's an association with a lot of these things um, being a certain way and I think that's where the idea of this progressivism comes in. Uh, we are no longer able to have clubs, charities, and other organizations that suit perhaps, if you know me and what I'm about, my ideas and my ideologies and political and social views, um, they get shut down, they get suppressed. They've been, uh, it was very different, say 50 years ago, we saw a lot more charities and humanitarian causes that were based around like uh, fostering better families, actually building communities up instead of tearing them down and destroying them. But again, we're at a unique crossroads right now. So there's this perception of Aquarius and Uranus being very progressive. But I think that's just the unique times we're in where there's this influence of corporations trying to exert their influence over people through or masquerading through NGOs and these other things uh, to break down identity in order to create kind of like economic slave units of humanity. And people are starting to pick up on that and there's resistance. So that Uranian resistance is rising up in people right now. And I think a lot of people had this negative view of the age of Aquarius where it's like the takeover of corporations and all this. And while that's a trait of Saturn and Saturn is a traditional ruler of Aquarius, that's a lot more Capricorn-like. I think we're gonna see a lot more opposition and rebellion in this long period that we're entering into. 
so one of the best ways of kind of giving an idea of how Uranus functions is to talk about it where it is right now. And this is the next section here. There's something called the dignities, which planets have where they're uh, in their uh, home sign or the rulership sign that's their domicile. They're strong there. Then there's the place where they're in their detriment, where they're at the weakest. Then there's also their fall and their exaltation. These are um, a little different in that they're not... So exaltation is where a planet is also thought of as stronger, but it's not so much, in my view, in understanding of it, it's not stronger per se, it's louder. And then the fall, it's not like the detriment, even though it's a negative place for the planet to be, it's not weaker, it's just suppressed. So it has the same strength, but it's muffled, it's muzzled, it has a mask over its face. So right now, Uranus entered Taurus back in 2018, and you know that long cycle means it's going to be going through roughly till 2025, seven, seven and a half years per sign that it's in. Um, so we still have a little ways to go. Um, we're not even halfway, but Taurus rules the mouth and uh, throat and speech, and Uranus is rebellion, freedom. So you have this interesting thing going on where uh, Taurus is Uranus's literal fall, where it's suppressed. Taurus rules the mouth, and Uranus is the desire to be rebellious. So if we're talking about Taurus, which would naturally be about speech and the throat, what is suppressed Uranus in Taurus like? It's like a mask over your face. It didn't start right at the start of um, Uranus entering Taurus. So 2018, yeah, we only got the masks this year and they're only starting to be enforced heavily now. But I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to try and drag this out till the end of this period. Maybe not right to the exact day that it starts leaving and going into Gemini. But I could foresee this being kind of a trend for the next few years. If it does end sooner, you know, there's other things we can see as... Uh, exemplary of Uranus and Taurus, um, but that is one manifestation, I think, of this time period. Now, I think what a lot of people make the mistake of doing, if we're talking about the real drive that Uranus has, uh, which is to be rebellious, and in Taurus you could say it's about rebellious speech, freedom of speech. When you get masked, if you're rebelling against the mask, you're forgetting about the fact that you're trying to say something else right before you got the mask. So if you make it all about the mask and rebelling against the mask, you're forgetting about rebelling on and about something else, which may be a more important issue. So that's part, I think, of what the mask serves from the perspective of those who want to enforce people to wear it, is it's a distraction. If you get people all caught up and angry and, yeah, wear your mask, no, don't wear your mask. You get people getting in fights in grocery stores about something that is a distraction. On one hand, yes, it's important to uh, fight for a right not to wear it. It seems pretty useless to me as far as what I've seen. They don't do much of anything. Maybe in the context of a very tight space, like a surgical room, you can show that it has a benefit for the doctor not to catch something from the patient or vice versa, probably even more so vice versa. But in a big grocery store, I think it's the most useless thing ever. Probably the distancing thing is a bigger deal for not transmitting uh, a virus. Let's not actually go there too much, because I am putting this on YouTube and I don't want to get this taken down, but it is an interesting thing that this seems more of a distraction, because I think there's lots of things that were big topics leading up to this period where they've started enforcing this um, that they wanted to suppress and not have people talking about online. And that's the stuff that people need to make a bigger priority than whether or not you get upset about the mask. But it is interesting that it is a perfect fit symbolically for this time period astrologically. A major thing I think we're going to see and have already started to see is revolts about food. Uh, in India there was a big farmer revolt not too long ago, a few months ago or maybe just a month ago. It was supposedly like the biggest protest in history, like 250 million people came out or something to the streets all over India. Farmers basically saying, you know, we're being screwed and whatever uh, imposition by the state is being put on farmers for like maybe price regulation of crops and things. I think you'll probably see similar things in the West and or um, 
it'll be about the food supply and rising prices of food, which is probably bound to start happening in the next few months, if not years, uh, sort of tail end or halfway point of Uranus and Taurus. But if we think of Taurus and the things it governs as a sign, you have food, uh, speech, um, and specifically the body part is the throat, obviously, money, and just basically mobile wealth or any kind of wealth. And the unique thing, one of the more positive things, despite Uranus being in its fallen Taurus, so it's got that suppressed quality around it, is we saw the advent of cryptocurrency. So yes, cryptocurrency was first created 12 years ago now, um, back in 2009. Um, so that would have been, I guess, Uranus and Pisces, the tail end of Uranus and Pisces. But um, we saw the first major uh, spike and bull run in Bitcoin's price, which made sort of global headlines, was that 2017 uh, rise up to just under $20,000 per Bitcoin. And even though that was before Uranus made its first move into Taurus, it was about a few months before, you had that build up to that point. And then obviously there's a big uh, bear market after that, that really only just started to show the signs of ending, uh, I guess after the uh, big drop in the lockdown drop that happened in all markets, I believe that was like March 13th or 12th or something. I, I remember that day because I was watching the markets and I just remember seeing this big line going down and it was a good opportunity to get in at the bottom when it bottomed out at like 3.5 thousand per Bitcoin. But that was like the next bottom. Yes, it had gone lower, uh, further back a few uh, years back, back in, I guess, 2018. It had gone down to one and a half thousand dollars. And it's been going up at that point since, but it was never getting back up close to that $20,000 level until just a few months ago, uh, where we've seen the start of this next bull run phase which I believe is going to go much higher uh, still, even though a lot of people feel like they might have already missed out. I think it's still just might have a cooling off period for a bit. But I think this next year we're going to see cryptocurrency become much more widely used and adopted. And you're going to, have, like I said, Hive, which I want people to go check out. I've got a link below. You can check it out through. If you create an account on that blockchain, you can join all these different apps with that one account. So it's very simple in that you have access to all these accounts without having to create all these different um, accounts with different emails and passwords and things. So again, I'll be doing a video on that and um, maybe how easy it is to set up and what options you have with that and what it looks like. But um, we're gonna see a lot of innovation with these things. You've got Ethereum, you have DeFi, which is decentralized finance, which is emerging. And this is all a challenge to the old industry, the legacy industries, uh, if finance, big Torian topic, is finance obviously uh, banking and Uranus there it's creating this rebellious quality in it but also through technology um, which is fantastic it's I think the most positive aspect of Uranus and Taurus has been this whereas the downside is going to be a lot of economic hardship you know, with that suppressive quality actually coming in whether it's in the food world uh, you could also say um, food technology is changing where you see a lot of talk about people needing to eat maggot or not maggots necessarily, but like mealworms and bugs turned into like protein powder um, and then lab grown meat, etc. A lot of these sort of dystopian cyberpunk nasty stuff that is possibly going to be pushed on us, um, unfortunately. But I think we can also resist that. And if we can just make it through the end of Uranus and Taurus, I think we might see a shift in that because a lot of people just have a strong aversion to that. So we have to hold on to that resistance against, uh, I guess, corporatized denaturing of our the food quality that we have access to. And actually, if you think back to the last time uh, Uranus was in Taurus, you had food shortages because it was World War II. So that was an interesting time. You can kind of get some vibes of the same thing going on. Uh, a lot of people pointed out that the rise of Trump paralleled the rise of Hitler. And yes, they're not remotely comparable in terms of what they stand for there was a similar vibe to their uh, sort of populist uprising. I'd say Hitler much more so in terms of being authentic, in terms of what he stood for and the people's faith in him, whereas Trump has some sides to him not so favorable to, uh, I guess, his image of what he was talking about. He's kind of done other things while letting other things slide. Whether that changes if he 
something unique happens and he somehow manages to move forward after this unique period. Now, after Uranus and Taurus, we have Uranus and Gemini. And that's actually the first time Uranus was seen in the sky it was in 1690. And that was actually Uranus and Gemini, even though uh, they didn't have the name for it. They didn't identify it with what it was connected to. And interestingly, in 1692, while Uranus was still in Gemini, you had the Salem Witch Trials. I'm just going to go through it. And this is the next section here. We're going to go, just go through some ideas of different points in history. And you can see some of the themes. You could do this for any one sign. I'm just focusing on Gemini here. Um, and so in, you had the Salem Witch Trials. The Nine Year War overlapped this whole period from uh, 1688 to 1697, um, which also had uh, the Scottish Jacobite Uprising at the same time um, as the Jacobite War in Ireland both between 1688 and 1692. And then Louis XIV in France against the Holy Roman Empire in Austria, as well as um, French colonists in North America versus the British. Then there was also the Streltsy Uprising in Russia in 1698. Those were all um, happening all across the world, kind of roughly in the same period. A lot of it was when Uranus was in Gemini. And if you fast forward one whole cycle of Uranus later, 84 years, when it's back in Gemini, this is actually when it was confirmed as a planet in 6, 1781. And what you had um, was actually the, obviously the 1776 Revolutionary War. And obviously you've had the first French Revolution in 1789. Um, so 1776, discovery of Uranus in 1781, then the French Revolution. Again, you skip ahead one whole Gemini cycle, 84 years, 1860, you had Lincoln elected and the American Civil War was from 61 to 65 of um, the 1800s, 1861 to 1865. So again, one whole cycle later, you have this big revolutionary period. 84 years again, and you come up to 1944, World War II. So that was the end of Uranus and Taurus going into Uranus and Gemini sort of the ending of the war. So this is never hard and fast where like a war sp begins right at the start of a planet going to a sign and then ending right on the dot of it leaving it, um, depending on what planet you're talking about. But with Uranus and its seven and a half year transit through a sign, it's often oddly overlapping a lot of these periods of uh, wars that are somewhat topical to the idea of rebellion, not necessarily a pure rebellion in some of the cases I listed, but oftentimes they actually are, the American Civil War. You could say uh, World War II was the rebellion of Germany against, obviously, the communists coming in from the East and uh, Western liberalism. You also had the two atomic bombs ha being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki just a few months after um, Uranus had moved back into Gemini. So uh, with very slow moving planets, their retrogrades happen every year because of the orbit. I'm not going to get into that actually, but if you look at the way planets orbit, if you can imagine looking up at the sky and us going around the sun, the planet does this retrograde action in the sky where it comes back but then goes forward again. That retrograde action as a planet that is that slow moving gets close to the edge of the sign. In the case of Uranus, it will always retrograde back because it takes like four or five steps forward and then three steps back. So you're never going to have a period where it doesn't actually um, retrograde back and forth at least once. So as it came out of Taurus into Gemini, um, you actually had the Battle of Stalingrad. And it was the turning point in the war for Germany. So Germany was actually doing quite well up until Uranus left Taurus. And then, you know, it comes back into Taurus briefly. It recovers a little bit, but then it finalizes and gets into Gemini. And, and then it's evident that they're definitely toast at that point in history. And you also had uh, the two A-bombs dropped, like I said, just at the point there in 1945, not long after that final transit into Gemini. Now there's this interesting thing that was pointed out in a great video by B.R. Taylor. I've talked about him in some of my other astrological videos. If you take the year zero, birth of Christ, and you retroactively figure out where Uranus was at, it was actually in Taurus. Now you add 84 year cycles times 23 to that, you get 1933. You add another 84 year cycle, you get 2017. So that's the idea of uh, 1933, 
rise or election of uh, the NSDAP, and then 2017, the inauguration of Trump. Yes, he was elected in 2016, but the very end of it. <clears throat> very similar things going on there. What I think is also interesting, if you take the number 23, um, you think of the zodiac chart with the alphabet around it, the 23rd letter of the alphabet is W, falls in Aquarius. Um, the W has two points on the bottom, two, and then three points on the top, three. Interesting little thing there. You can also see the W prominent in certain things like certain corporate symbols that emerged at that time. Whether this means corporations, etc., are involved in occult knowledge and dissemination and incorporate that into their signs and symbols or not, or whether it just happens as coincidence through direct influence of the planetary spheres in our minds and through our creative processes, I don't know. But I think there's some interesting th stuff there. Now in this next section, I want to talk about the tech trends per sign. Um, we had in Uranus and Aquarius from 1995 to 2003, we had things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth coming to prominence. And if you think of Aquarius, it has to do with that air quality, so it's things moving through the air. Um, the symbol of Uranus itself kind of looks like a radio dish or antenna, a 5G tower. You had the Tor project begin in 2002, so that web browser um, that allows you to access the deep web and has some degree of anonymity. Then you also have the Human Genome Project. To what degree the Human Genome Project was Aquarian, I'm not sure. I stuck it in there. I did make this list a while ago. I might have had a more direct idea of why I was putting that there. But you can obviously go through and look at the tech trends as well as research and innovation type trends in uh, academia and you can kind of see themes within each vague period. When Uranus was in Pisces in 2003 to 2011, you had HDTV, Blu-ray, um, I'm sure there was actually a lot of innovations in drugs. Um, so Piscean topics have to do with illusions, um, TV and television and media is a big factor in that. Blu-ray, literally the word blue there in Pisces is a water sign and it's often depicted as being blue in color because it has the fish, it's very watery and emotional and mutable. Uranus and Aries, which is the one that ended in 2019, you had, um, it went from 2010 to 2019. This is much more warlike and fiery. You had, uh, not they'd already been invented obviously, but drones, you had the big uh, increase in their use in warfare um, and unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, they also became more prominent as home use, whether it's to get video footage or um, carrying items <laughs> across borders to smuggle things, etc. They've become very prominent specifically from 2010 to 2019. Obviously they're increasingly becoming popular, but there was that first sort of break on to the cultural zeitgeist of humanity, which is what Uranus represents happened with Uranus in Aries. And to go further into this period, we had social media grew and became the most prominent during this time. Aries and the first house, it's all about the self, the face, um, your perception of self, other people's perception of you. So social media is a very first house topic. It does have elements of the 11th house, uh, obviously because you're having interactions with groups of people, but in terms of how its effect on you, it is a first house topic, which fits well with Aries. And um, yeah, those companies like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, they all became huge during this period. And it's interesting that we're not that far into Taurus and we're all just seeing the cracks in their uh, foundation starting to weaken. Even though they're still giants of tech, I think the public's perception of them has changed drastically uh, in very short time, with specifically around political stuff. But you had the personal smartphone obviously get um, very popular during this time that allowed for easy access to social media plus the camera. You know, the front facing camera is right there in your face, and you also had um, the mass use of facial recognition technology and security and CCTV cameras. Plus you also had the social media application that became big with face filters and overlaying of images and things on people's faces. Yes, it's here now and it's still growing as a technology, but it got its first explosion onto the scene in a big way during 
Uranus and Aries. And again, Aries, as the first sign, rules the head, face, and persona, and self-identity. Like I said, Taurus's mouth, throat, and all the signs in zodiacal order work down through the body in that way, with Pisces dealing with the feet. I tried to look to see if there was any association with Pisces and technology with the feet. Um, I didn't fully or immediately see anything. I mentioned, uh, just going back to that, the drugs, specifically because Pisces in its negative context is associated with um, drug addiction, but it can also be uh, dealing with medical drugs, so it's more neutral or even positive it's a, if it's a drug that's essential for extending someone's life. Just specific dates here, um, facial image recognition used by FBI began in 2011 with the NGI project, Next Generation Identification. Facial image recognition on social media began in 2013 with Luxury, um, so yeah, that fits in there too, and bought by Snapchat in 2015. UK police have used live facial recognition through CCTV at public events since 2015. Face recognition phone unlock on the iPhone 10 in 2017 came about. Facial recognition and surveillance first rolled out at, a Van at the Vancouver International Airport in 2017. So that kind of concludes that whole period. You can see there's a lot to do with the face and Aries head, etc. So far in Taurus, I've kind of gone over these 2018 to 2026. That's, uh, 2026 is the final point of it, whereas it, again, because there's that transition period of a few months, um, it first starts to leave in 2025, the end of it. Uh, you get a period of it being in Gemini, then it comes back to Taurus, and then finally goes into Gemini in 2026. We've seen the of things changing in the food industry. We're seeing sort of this push for sort of like the Beyond Meat burgers, the Cricket Burger protein powders. I'm sure we're going to see some food shortages, unfortunately, but there may be, on the positive side, better farming practices through technology, whether that's good or not, we'll have to see. GMOs have been a big thing for a long time. But um, those have oddly sort of fallen by the wayside, but we may see a resurgence of the push for GMOs during this period. 3D printing was happening before 2018, obviously, but I think we're going to see very soon much more widespread adoption of it. Maybe there's going to be some very cheap um, home purchasable printers that might become mass produced um, that are also of good quality. Kind of like with the drones, those came about and they had this ability for them to be mass produced in a cheap enough way that they became uh, very simple entertainment goods almost. Another second house topic is stuff. So I talk about finances with Taurus, but there's also stuff and things. And um, the internet of things has again been something that's been around where people hook their fridge and their locks on their door and in my opinion a lot of stupid stuff gets connected up to the internet. There may be some use of these types of technologies, but I think it's largely a problem, but you're gonna see more people adopting that. Uh, we've seen instances of like servers going down at like Google and people who have Google locks on their home that are like unlocked with like a bracelet or maybe even a chip in their arm <laughs> getting locked out of their home because the power went out at the place where their data is stored for that to function properly. But yeah, I think you can expect maybe some improvements in that area or more people adopting internet of things type technologies. Video streaming has taken a big jump in quality. Um, people can now stream in you know, 4K and that ties in with that sort of Torian laziness of just like vegging out and watching TV. And yes, we had obviously YouTube and video before that, but I think the mass adoption of all these video streaming uh, things, not just video gaming when I said 4K, but like Netflix, and Apple TV, etc. Um, those have been still very recent, and it was during that period of the beginning of Uranus coming into uh, Taurus. Obviously, I already mentioned cryptocurrency and institutional acceptance, which is just on the verge of happening, has already begun, and that's going to have this huge effect on this bull run. The bull run is a Taurian thing, so we had one at the very start, or just before the start of Uranus and Taurus, we're having another one right now, and I think we might even see the start of the one after this one, because we're going to have, obviously, a, a cooling off period of a few years after this one, um, and that would bring us up maybe two-thirds of the way through Uranus and Taurus, so we might have maybe the one that really gets it to the height of mass adoption globally, um, where you might see Bitcoin hitting like a million dollars per Bitcoin by the end of Uranus and Taurus. Seems extreme to think about, but I think in this one alone we're going to be hitting uh, six figures for Bitcoin. 
um, and that's just in the next year or so. But like I said, this Bitcoin has like a, it seems to also extend over time with each cycle. Um, but you're going to have uh, three, maybe even four years of a cool down period. And then right at the end of that, we're going to be close to the end of actually Uranus and Taurus. And we'll see possibly the next bull run after this one happening still with Uranus and Taurus. You've also seen the adoption of um, Alexa, Google Home, and all these other things, and Siri being very recent. People have already gotten used to this idea of just talking out loud to devices, and that voice activation, that's Uranus and Taurus technology, voice connection. We obviously, with the pandemic, you had um, Trump initiating a big mass production, converting, I think, some factories in the US to producing respirators, respiration is uh, even though the lungs are more um, cancer oriented the lungs and chest are ruled by cancer um, obviously the entrance to the lungs is the mouth uh, so that's an interesting connection there on a small little sort of surge in production that happens sort of a out of the blue event of a sudden creation of a lot of technology and then some of the negative things would be sort of the uranus in its fall being the suppression what we've seen especially after Charlottesville, which was, I guess, uh, tw the summer of 2017. So after Charlottesville, you had big crackdowns in a major way on freedom of speech. And that was sort of the first wave of it, which we're seeing now with sort of on more normy tier conservatives. Um, but it began really right at the, that cusp of Uranus entering Taurus, the crackdown on freedom of speech online, but also the attack on the finances of people that were creating this content online. Uh, even in a few rare cases of people's actual bank accounts being shut down. So not only payment processors on people's websites were being targeted for shutdown, payment processors are being technology online, their freedom of speech being associated with that, it's very connected there. And the solution to that is going to be and has been cryptocurrency for a lot of these fringe movements, politically speaking. So we're probably going to see some other things that emerge out of this period. Um, that's really my kind of synopsis of it. Uh, just to kind of give a preview of what I think Uranus and Gemini will be, which will be 2025 to 2033. I think we're going to see huge advancements in AI. Gemini is very associated with um, cognition. Even though it's uh, the body, parts of the body associated with is the shoulders and arms and hands, Geminis tend to be one of the most intelligent signs um, associated with intelligence and their quick thinking, and they can kind of like multitask very easily. Um, there may be some sort of like brain to computer interface type technology that's emerging during this time or becoming more widespread adopted. I know there's already existences of certain types of that. Gemini rules the third house, which has to do with short distance travel and um, elementary school information collection. Um, there's a number of different topics there and you're gonna see technology specifically in those areas. So self-driving cars is gonna be a huge one. I think it's gonna become a thing during this period and widespread adoption. They're obviously already working on that technology. It's almost at the point of being uh, coming to market, if not already there in very small amounts, but I think it'll be kind of standard by the end of uh, Uranus and Gemini. When it comes to neighborhoods, I think a lot of what Tesla is doing is probably going to have an influence here where there could be like uh, power generation localized to very small communities, uh, which will allow communities to pop up almost anywhere where there could be one large power station that can be enough for a community of you know a couple dozen to two three dozen houses uh, or homes or even just one building and that's going to make um, you know access to technology uh, because of the power very uh, quick another thing you might see if we're talking about the shoulders and arms is while well, they already have very good s cybernetic arms I think it's going to become almost kind of like to us right now it would seem like science fiction, almost kind of like Luke Skywalker's hand in uh, Star Wars. They might even have the effect of skin that looks so realistic that people will have arms that uh, are robotic, but at a first glance you wouldn't even be able to tell because that's how far the technology may have come in such a short period of time. Likewise, that would extend to the legs and feet and prosthetics of different types. But when we think of prosthetics, a lot of people first think of uh, arms and hands. And so that's going to be representative of perhaps that advancement in technology, specifically with information gathering, which is that third house topic. And when we talk about brain computer interfacing, we might have an ability, and again, it sounds crazy, but in very short order, the ability to download information 
directly to our brains. That might be more towards the end of it. We're talking 2030s, the early 2030s. That's still a decade away, so you know a lot can happen in such a short period of time. Now the last thing I want to talk about as a section with Uranus is uh, natural disasters, because even though Uranus doesn't rule natural disasters as a common thought, one thing people have noticed is that as it changes signs, there tends to be a shift in the types of disasters that tend to happen in more abundance. And in particular, there's a lot of disasters at that point of the shift, both as in the first crossing, but also when it goes back and then forward again. Now, not every single natural disaster that ever happens um, is always within the elemental theme that we're talking about, so earth, air, water, fire. You could categorize all natural disasters into one of those fires, fire, earthquakes, earth, floods and tsunamis, water, sometimes a combination of water and earth, volcanoes would be a combination of fire and earth, uh, tornadoes and hurricanes, air, obviously when they're uh, talking about hurricanes it's kind of a water air thing, so it's often even because it's transition between signs you'll get both elements, so in the last tra transition from Aries to Taurus, the volcanoes in Hawaii was the most overt example of it. You have the earth with the rock creating new land, the lava is very fiery, it was burning up people's crops and things on the particular islands that it was happening. But let's go back to, and just I'll give a few examples. Also if you look through disasters throughout history and you look for world record disasters, I'd say 8 times out of 10, uh, the type of disaster they are for that element, even though they might not happen right on the changeover period of Uranus going through signs, whatever element for the sign Uranus when it's in in that time correlates with that natural disaster. Uh, so you'll hear a few of them as I go through these. So Capricorn um, to Aquarius, so Uranus going from Capricorn Earth to Aquarius air transition was from 1995 to 1996, and the Kobe earthquake of January 1995 was a 7.0 magnitude, which killed 6,434 people. It was the second deadliest earthquake in, in Japan in the 20th century. May 1995, the Neftegorsk earthquake in far eastern Russia on the island of Sakhalin, due north of Japan, was a 7.1 earthquake. It was the most destructive earthquake on record within the current territory of Russia. 2,040 people of the island's 3,977 residents died, so half the island's population wiped out with this earthquake. February 1996, the Biak earthquake hit Biak Island in Indonesia, had a magnitude of 8.2. 166 people were killed. Um, October, November 98, Category 5 hurricane Mitch, second deadliest in history next to the Great Hurricane of 1780. Um, so Hurricane Mitch hit Central America, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and South Florida. Between 11,000 and 19,000 people died. It caused six billion dollars in damage. So remember, this was going from an Earth sign to an Aquarius sign for Uranus. So you had some of the worst earthquakes in recent history, some of the worst hurricanes still on record, and that was in this period of transition. And then in September 2004, so this wasn't at the point of transition, but this was. Um, Uranus in Aquarius, there was a Category 3 hurricane, Jean, which hit the Caribbean and eastern U.S., killing 3,037 people and costing just under $8 billion in damage. So when Uranus went from Aquarius to Pisces in 2003, um, there didn't seem to be any single record-breaking cataclysm during this ingress period, but natural disasters in general killed five times more people around the world in 2003. Uh, than in previous years. This is according to the world's top reinsurance company called Munich Re from Germany. Um, in December 2004, so just after it was fully in Pisces, there was the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. If you remember those, there was footage of that, and that was kind of imprinted in my mind. It was really devastating, and it was really sort of at the cusp of when people had a lot more access to video cameras, so there was a lot of different footage that was shown. That killed 230,000 people in 14 countries with waves up to 100 feet high. It was a 9.5 magnitude earthquake and while it only lasted 10 seconds it was the third largest earthquake ever recorded. But yeah the effect of that tsunami was just absolutely disastrous. August and September 2004 Typhoon Songda was the fourth costliest on record. 
after causing 12.6 billion in damage and killing 28 people. So yeah, Typhoon is that air quality, but again, this is happening over oceans. So there's that water element there as well. August 2005 was Category 5 Hurricane Katrina, just 1.5 years after Uranus had left Aquarius. 1,833 people, mostly due to the flooding, uh, and caused 125 billion in damage. So in these cases where I'm talking about hurricanes in uh, Uranus and Pisces, um, the damage wasn't the hurricane itself, it was the flooding after the fact. In October 2005 was the Category 1 Hurricane Stan that hit Central America and Mexico, but still killed 1,668 people and caused uh, 4 billion in damages. May 2008 was Cyclone Nargis, which hit Myanmar. The death toll climbed to 138,000. But critics have said this was underreported to avoid political fallout. Um, it was the eighth deadliest cyclone of all time. Now this next period of Pisces going to Aries, um, when I first heard about Uranus being associated with cycles, this was one that actually blew my mind and first got me interested in Uranus as a planet and the unique things it's associated with and these cycles that we see it being correlated with. Um, so Pisces water into Aries fire transitioned from 2010 to 2011. Fukushima power plant explosion happened um, on March 11th, 2011 due to a tsunami caused by a roughly 7 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Japan. 18,500 people died. This was the last day of Uranus and Pisces before it ingressed into Aries on March 12th. So that was like a right on the dot of the changeover. Um, and so that's the flooding being water and the explosion of the power plant being the, uh, the effect of Aries. <laughs> then you have Aries to Taurus transition, which again, that was that reason when I mentioned 2018 to 2019 was that transition period. And uh, you had Hawaii, Kilauea, uh, lower Puna eruptions began after small earthquakes on May 3rd and 4th and continued for a few weeks destroying farmland and other properties and infrastructure. It had nearly ended by early August and um, was declared finished on December 5th. Uh, while volcanic activity is on a general uptrend over the last century, so volcanoes in general have been on an uptrend, 2019 was a particular active time with 73 eruptions and 27 of those being new ones and not continued from previous year. So we're talking about eruptions in Hawaii. Then you of course had um, the California wildfires in 2017 and 2018. Um, so this again is right around that transition period. A little less earth, more fire, and topic being off topic there, but you could say it's fire on the land, it's destroying all this um, homes and property, and earth is very much associated with people's homes. So 2017's fires were the costliest to date um, and affected 1,381,405 acres and cost just under $18 billion in damage. Uh, there's 47 deaths. 2018's fires were not the worst on record compared to the previous years, um, and mostly during mid-July, August of 2018, right after Uranus first entered Taurus that spring, and national disaster was declared in Northern California August 4th, a total of 1,893,913 acres affected and 3.5 billion in damage. So it was actually more land was destroyed by these fires, but less uh, costly damage. Um, and there was 103 deaths. And then there were fires in California in 2019 as well, but they were nowhere, nowhere near as bad. Um, still above average in terms of size and damage with, uh, I think, 259,823 acres affected, but only five deaths. Um, so you can kind of see this trend and you might even say, oh, but well, what about these Australian bushfires um, of September 2019 to March 2020? You know, Uranus is firmly into Taurus at this point. Why are there still these fires going on? Well, it's not to say that uh, disasters of every type can't happen at any other time. And there's other astrological phenomenon that might affect things, but we're talking about overall trends. Something we have seen um, it, so far into Taurus is that there's been an uptrend in earthquakes. There hasn't been any one big devastating earthquake yet, but there has been, I think, a three or four times increase in frequency of earthquakes around the world so far in the last few years as compared to the previous decade. Whether that means we're going to have some big devastating earthquake event, I don't know. Could be. It would make sense that it would happen, but uh, let's pray that it doesn't. Um, but these are interesting to note that often world record disasters, whether it's death total, cost, or size of something, tends to happen in its correlating 
elementary sign of wherever your illness is at. So um, that kind of wraps up everything I wanted to go over. There's definitely more I could go into with Uranus. It's kind of endless, but it is fascinating. I find there's more information out there on this particular planet as opposed to Neptune or Pluto with these types of trends. Uh, but do let me know what you think in the comments below. Check out the links below. Um, I'll link to some of these things I've mentioned, especially the Hive ecosystem if you want to sign up for that and uh, get engaging with me over there, which is where I'm going to be posting all of my content from now on. I'll put it out continuously on other legacy social media platforms as well, but uh, that is really where I'm going to begin putting my focus. So like, favorite, and share the video if you feel so inclined. Hope you've enjoyed this, and I'll talk to you again soon. Take care and embrace life without limits.